So what we're going to do, what we're going to talk about today, I'd like us to talk about, first of all, I'm sort of what do we need to know to understand these new findings. So I was going to go back through a few of the slides I've shown before, just because they're critical now that, to understand all these new advances. We really kind of have to understand what Alzheimer's is and what we know about it so far. I also want to talk to you a little bit about what are kind of the latest things in genetics, in drug development, and in biomarkers, the way we define Alzheimer's disease early, because these are always big questions everybody has. And then I want to talk about something new called big data, which is essentially, this is a critical thing, it's kind of mundane, but this whole idea now of being able to take these giant studies that have been occurring elsewhere and looking at them in terms of Alzheimer's disease actually turns out to be absolutely the most critical thing and really wasn't really talked about much till this year. And then a little bit about what's going on in the land of politics and Alzheimer's disease and things like that. If we get a chance, or I'll zoom through those slides because they're political and we don't care. And then, and then a, a little bit, we'll end with a little bit more about what we can do for ourselves and what all this data and all this information really sort of says to us or how we need to look at that information. So I usually start out just by mentioning what dementia is because usually, and we've already talked, I've talked to two different folks uh, here tonight about this, just the whole idea of what is dementia and what is Alzheimer's disease. So dementia is like that umbrella term of which Alzheimer's is a part of it. But really, a dementia simply means a group of symptoms that describe a cognitive or behavioral change. It's a decline. So that's really what the dementia is, really, is just a decline. They are often progressive, and as I said, Alzheimer's disease is the most common one. Here's the, here's the sort of list of, of some of the more common dementias. Um, Alzheimer's disease, again, you can see, is by far the highest, with 50 to 70 percent. I mean, some folks even will tell you, I got the stick, see, I'm going to need the stick. Va um, vascular and mixed, really, in many ways, are part of Alzheimer's disease, and other is part of Alzheimer's disease. So really, all, if we could understand Alzheimer's disease, we've understood a big chunk of the picture. So it's important that, uh, to look at that. Alzheimer's disease, classically, symptoms occur after age 65. It has insidious gradual onset, memory loss, early memory loss is prominent, usually, often the first sign, but not always. There's preserved strength, coordination, gait, those that the motor skills are all preserved. It's, and um, there's always an impairment in at least two cognitive areas. It used to be memory plus, but now it's two cognitive areas because now we know having followed so many people for so long, we know that sometimes somebody can present with language difficulties and decision-making problems and not memory for a number of years, and yet they end up having Alzheimer's disease. So there are very different patterns in the brain and how this goes, a lot of differences in judgment, a lot of differences, excuse me, in, uh, in the signs of the disorder. Another thing I want to talk about is mild cognitive impairment. This has really become a really critically important term now. What this started out to be was the idea that somebody has mild cognitive impairment if they have difficulties that are noticeable, that are, that are evident, but it's not affecting their everyday lives. This is not a dementia, because that's the key to the dementia is you've had a decline and it affects your ability on a daily basis. Mild cognitive impairment means you've had a decline, but it hasn't really affected anything. There's various, all sorts of complicated rubrics. There's, there's um, uh, amnestic MCI, which means memory MCI, which is by far the largest group of these patients. But there are also people over here who are called non-amnestic MCI. They don't start with memory problems, but like I say, a good percentage of them, you know, I always wanted to twirl, but I, I never learned them. A good percentage of them end up having Alzheimer's disease. That's what we're really trying to understand. What do these earliest signs mean? Normal aging, MCI, there are clear differences. In normal aging, we, we, we have occasional losses of memory for words or names. My kids will tell you I had that you know, 
basically from age 25 on. Slow processing speed, difficulty sustaining attention, no functional impairment. As we get older, we just have, we have some changes in, in the speed at which we do things in our memory. But MCI is memory impairment beyond what's expected. Other cognitive functions are generally unimpaired. Daily functioning is generally, we used to say daily functioning is not impaired, but we know now that folks with mild cognitive impairment can have difficulties with higher order things, things at work, things like that, things about managing complex money and things like that. So that last point is not really very true, we know now. But that was sort of the, the taken as the, as the definition for a long time. So it's a continuum. We have, we have normal and we have dementia. And the idea is in the middle comes mild cognitive impairment. This is really important because in a sense that it's a big time now because of medication trials and things. So, so Alzheimer's disease at, at the last um, AAIC sort of was the big rollout for the change in in terminology, and the big change in terminology was there are three stages. One is dementia. Another one is this mild cognitive impairment that now we say has a, has a clinical picture, and there are guidelines now on how to say that that clinical picture is probably of the Alzheimer's type. So what the research, what the, what NIH and everybody has agreed to is you could now be called mild cognitive impairment, but if you have certain other features, biological features, and we'll look at those on imaging or other things, I could now say you have mild cognitive impairment of the Alzheimer's type. Why is that important? Because then I can treat you. Or then you could join a clinical trial, whereas before, if you didn't have a diagnosis, you couldn't be in a clinical trial. Imaging or Pardon me? Uh, we'll talk about that structural imaging or functional. They all now have, each of these imaging types now has a certain pattern that's been associated with, with the Alzheimer's disease. And appears to, when it occurs, seems to occur early in my cognitive impairment as well. Um, and then the other term that's interesting is the, is the preclinical stage. This is also important because this is now part Remember, this is called a redefinition of Alzheimer's disease, so the preclinical stage is now part of that definition. And what that preclinical stage is, it says there's no criteria for clinical diagnosis, but it represents a staging for research. So the idea behind the preclinical stage is that I can't see any cognitive difficulties necessarily, but there are brain changes going on, and I know those are associated with Alzheimer's. I mean, these are pretty major steps that have occurred. It's all around treatment, but by changing the definition, it, it includes a much wider range of people in clinical trials, and it, it's a much, it's a, it's, some people argue this is way too, too much, shouldn't do it, other people say it's about time we did it. So preclinical Alzheimer's disease, and the reason why I'm talking about this is because this comes up in clinical trials now, preclinical Alzheimer's disease is measurable changes in biomarkers that indicate the earliest signs of disease before symptoms are even noticeable. It's consistent with the current thinking that says if you have brain changes that are of the Alzheimer's type, you will probably develop Alzheimer's. Maybe not necessarily, but probably. And it's no clinical criteria, again, there's no clinical criteria for this. The whole idea is there is no clinical evidence that we know of for this, but we can apply certain research standards and imaging or biomarkers, what we say, and, and suggest that. What, what, what's it similar to? It's actually very similar to if you have high cholesterol. If you have high cholesterol, you get treated. If you have high blood pressure, you get treated. But you may not have any other signs of heart disease. That's, that's where they want Alzheimer's to go. And that's where, where the field wants, wants, wants Alzheimer's to go. So let's also stop and just talk and, and kick through a few of the facts about Alzheimer's disease just so that we see the extent to which this disorder is significant. Sixth uh, leading cause of death in the United States. 
Five million Americans are living with the disease now. One in three seniors dies of Alzheimer's or with Alzheimer's disease. In 2012, 15.4 million caregivers provided an incredible amount of unpaid care, which is part of the, part of the issue with this disease. Nearly 15% of caregivers for people with Alzheimer's or another dementia are long-distance caregivers. They don't live next door. They don't live in the same house. And in 2013, Alzheimer's will cost the nation $2.3 billion. The number is $1.2 trillion by 2050. So I always like to say, don't listen to the senators talking about Medicare, Medicaid, and breaking the bank. And this, this one disorder itself will break the bank unless we find, find a solution to it. That's why suddenly there's a lot of interest in this in Alzheimer's. In, 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 the, in the Congress and things, when you finally put a money figure to it and you can demonstrate a budgetary figure to it, everybody suddenly gets really interested. Another thing that I think is important to understand is one in nine seniors has Alzheimer's disease, half have no idea they have it. Because, because so far we don't like to talk about it, we don't like to complain about it. Often physicians, honestly, don't like don't like to evaluate it because they say, why should I? What would be the point of doing that? Uh, we don't have any good medication. Why should we bother you and do that? It's a very significant disorder with a lot of people who have no idea they have it necessarily. They may know full well they have it, but, but no, nobody wants to recognize it. The prevalence. Uh, an American develops Alzheimer's disease every 33 seconds. You know, over 5 million uh, people have the disease, as we mentioned. Age is the primary risk factor. There's no other better risk factor than age. As we live longer, baby boomers mature. The number of, of persons with Alzheimer's disease grows exponentially because people are living longer and baby boomers are coming of age. So this is a dramatic, significant problem going on. Uh, by 2025, the number of people age 65 and older with Alzheimer's disease is expected to reach 7.1 million, a 40% increase from now. All because of the aging population and the fact that we live longer. By 2050, the number of people age 65 and older with Alzheimer's will triple to 13.8 million. Unless we can find some way to postpone that presentation by up to five years per person or whatever, this will be a very significant, significant hit. Mortality is very interesting. This, this came out this year. This study was completed as part of at the, at the AAIC at the international meeting, which is sort of, I'm trying to go over all that stuff today from that meeting, that the mortality numbers are up for Alzheimer's and pretty much down for everything else. There's, and why is that? Why should the, the numbers be so different for Alzheimer's compared to everybody else? Why should the numbers go up? Because, of course, people are getting older and getting the disorder. And also, frankly, because you wonder where the money goes. Think about the successes in cancer. Think about the successes in heart disease. Think about the, the successes in HIV. The other half of me does a lot of research in Africa with HIV and the cognitive difficulties that that, that brings out and how to treat HIV. I can't thank you enough for, for, you know, this chunk of the pie, but the other half of me is furious that Alzheimer's disease has so little. But again, we're back to the fact that people don't like to talk about it, people don't want to deal with it, and, and that's, that's a serious problem. And that problem comes out in terms of that little tiny slice of the pie that, that, uh, that goes to where the, the issues are. Now, the other thing I just want to talk about also, I just want to mention is again, it's something everybody here should know, but the impact on caregiving is just tremendous. You know, there are 15.4 million family and friends providing 17.5 billion hours of unpaid care for those with Alzheimer's. Uh, care is valued at, at, at a fortune. Eighty percent of care provided in the community is provided by unpaid caregivers. I know because I'm one myself. I mean, we just see this as a dramatic, dramatic uh, hold on the society. Nearly 50 percent of caregivers are long-distance caregivers. 
And we know that long distance caregivers pay more and often have more difficulties than those even within the same household. But the emotional stress of caregivers, this year at AAIC at the International Conference, there was a lot of data presented about more than 60% of AD caregivers rate emotional stress as high or very high in caregiving. 33% reported significant symptoms of depression. And very telling in this, caregivers had $9.1 billion in additional health care costs. One of the studies that came out of one, of one of the folks in my group was really looking at what happened, for example, to caregivers of, of individuals with mild cognitive impairment. What happens to a family when somebody has been identified as having mild cognitive impairment? Actually, it turns out the use of additional resources for health, the use of additional dollars, is about the same as if somebody had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We found very few, if any, differences between those two. So even mild cognitive impairment, where somebody is no longer functioning as effectively as they used to, can have a significant effect on the family. The cost of Alzheimer's disease, we've already sort of talked about, is astronomical. 30% of people with Alzheimer's disease and other dementias are on Medicare and Medicaid, compared to 11% of people without those conditions. So the strain on the financial situation in the country because of Alzheimer's disease is significant, and in particular it's significant for Alzheimer's, not compared to other disorders. So it's a, it's a big, big chunk of the Medicare and Medicaid. So once we've talked about how significant this disease is, let's talk a little bit about what it is so that we can understand where we really sit on this. The, the classic sign of Alzheimer's disease are things called plaques and tangles. So these are healthy cells. So these are cells in the body. Cells communicate with each other electrically, sort of the little lights. The, the electrical synapses, when I want to move my hand, to, to, um, to open up my Diet Coke here, which I have to have with me at all times. Um, don't, drink, don't drink too much Diet Coke, it's really bad for you. But me, you know, I enjoy it. But the, when I move my hand that way, that's a set of electrical impulses, right? It's a simple set of communication across cells from my brain down to my fingers that says move and flick that button. In Alzheimer's disease, you see these characteristic changes to the brain in which you get things called plaques, which is this sort of mushiness in the brain, this sort of roadblock in the brain, and you get tangles, which are these um, misshapen cells. See the difference? You get these, this, the shells misshape themselves. So that's the classic sign of what's called plaques and tangles. And what do those plaques essentially do? Those plaques essentially stop that simple electrical transmissions, right? You can't, you can't make these simple little connections anymore, frankly, because there's that big blob in the middle. And one of the studies that, that was done at the University of Michigan recently showed, for example, that those big globs bump into the cells themselves and harm the cells. So, so how those... Pardon me? You talk about it. It's, it's both. It, it intercepts the, 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 the chemicals are not produced effectively by the cells, so the neurochemical change doesn't occur, and then the transmission to the cell is disrupted because the cell breaks apart. So you really get both. Okay. You get an effect of both. And, and, and so I want to spend a little more time on this just to explain it. And I've shown these the past couple years. I've shown these cartoons because I really like these. Um, but they really tell the story about exactly what's going on, and we need to understand this story in order to understand what's new. Because all of treatment basically resides on this story. So, we have these cells, we all have these nice brain cells, and they all have coming out of them something called APP, or, or it's a precursor protein. It's a type, it's the, essentially the protein, the precursor protein that feeds the cells. So the cells sort of grow this essentially, and these things come along called enzymes that cut this sort of food growing out of the cells, 
those, so the cells can digest it. But what happens sometimes is it gets cut the wrong way. It doesn't get cut small enough. It might get cut too big or it might get cut in the wrong place. And we know what happens is we get clumps or, or something they call oligomers. But we get these plump clumps of beta amyloid plaque that occurs. So these clumps start to occur. Remember those fuzzy things that I showed you on the actual pictures before? Same sort of thing. We get these plaques forming. And the plaques form because normally, when you get that, that precursor protein, that, that amyloid precursor protein up there, you normally get alpha secretase comes along and cuts it into nice chunks. And gamma secretase comes along and creates essentially the nutrients that the, 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 that the cells need. Essentially, it, it develops the proteins that the cells need to exist. Okay? But what happens sometimes is if, if your brain is full of beta secretase and not alpha secretase, or your levels of beta secretase have increased so much that they now overshadow the alpha secretase, they come along and cut it at the wrong spot, and when it joins with gamma secretase, rather than making that nice protein, it makes a beta. It makes plaque. Make sense? Simple thing, big, big problem. But understand this linkage, and we have, we have a way of potentially solving the problem, or at least so everybody hopes. The other thing that happens, we know, is that as those plaques and tangles form, and there's a lot of discussion about chicken and egg and which comes first, and we won't get into that too much, but as those plaques and tangles start to form, as those plaques start to form, the cells themselves react. Whether it's a, a inflammation that occurs within the cells as, as if the cells are fighting to get rid of those plaques. But whatever happens, happens. And what, what occurs is that the very cell structure itself starts to fall apart. So you get, these, you get these microtubules that essentially are the things that communicate from cell to cell. And what happens is their very cement starts to fall out. Tau. Tau is what forms tangles, essentially. The tangles are the dying cells because the tau, where the cement, has fallen out. Why exactly it happens, or when it happens, is still a little bit of a discussion. Everybody thought they knew everything, and now they're not. So sure, as usual, but still, the point is, tau is the central piece to those tangles. The tangles seem to come after the plaques, but we think. But that is, that's the story of Alzheimer's, and what people call the amyloid cascade. So you have increased brain amyloid, you get amyloid deposits, you get inflammation because of them, causes tangles to be formed, and we lose, we lose nerve cells and neurochemicals because the cells die, they can't produce the neurochemicals that causes the interaction. So this is kind of a classic thing. So the interesting thing we'll talk about is the fact that right now, this is where we're treating the problem. These are the only drugs we have. Treat the problem right here, which is what you call symptomatic treatment. We're taking away, we're, we're enhancing cells, transmitting. We're trying to keep cells hanging around a little longer. But so far, not so sure if we have anything up here. But wouldn't this be the place to intersect, if we could? A lot harder than it looks. Incredibly easy in mice. But people are just so confusing and seriously. So the whole point of this is, because all this stuff is going on in the brain, and because we already know that when brain cells die, they die, we have been doing research for years down here, and I've shown this before here, but we've been doing all this research down here in the moderate to severe range of Alzheimer's disease to understand what's going on in the brain. Now that we understand that, we really need to be looking up here so we can prevent either here in normal aging 
to actually prevent the disorder, or when the AD pathology first appears, to try to, to break it, to stop it from occurring anymore. So that's the big interest now. Um, you know, back 30 years ago, all we could talk about was this. Now, frankly, everything is up here. Why is this shift important? Nobody wants to forget that we have patients with significant Alzheimer's disease and people are trying to develop treatments, but all the treatments have moved up here to before people have symptoms or right when they start to have symptoms. So this is where all the interest is, and this is only in the past two years, maybe past year, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute, why this has become such a hot topic. So, I want to talk about clinical trials because clinical trials, the research we do is critically important. Some of you may want to take part in it. Uh, you may have loved ones who you want to take part in those studies. But I want to kind of give you a sense for what that means. What is it that researchers deal with all the time? What is some of the jargon? You'll hear about it because then you can make a little better, better decisions about it or participate in one way or another. So, first of all, a clinical trial is basically a study looking at the effectiveness of, of a diagnostic test or the effectiveness of a treatment. But there are different types of clinical trials, and these are the terms that people use. They call them diagnostic studies, in which there, there, there are um, studies about new tests to diagnose the disease. There are treatment or clinical trials that are what we're really interested in very much so in Alzheimer's disease, which are testing new treatments or new combinations of treatments. There are prevention trials, which here is where everybody is suddenly interested. Prevention trials. Can you prevent the disease before it even occurs? Are there ways to present, pre prevent the onset of the disease? There are also screening studies that we do, a number of these at the University of Michigan, looking at ways to identify in a large population of people who might be at risk. Why are these screening studies important? Because if you can do really good screening, you know who to put in prevention trials. If you can figure out ahead of time who might be most at risk, you can put them in a prevention trial before they even have a problem. So screening studies are really important. Quality of life studies are important as well, just to understand when someone develops Alzheimer's disease, what are the things that make a difference? I can tell you, I was just at a meeting in Washington at, at, at NIH and the government where there's a lot of discussion now about something that should be rather obvious, which is researchers should stop telling people what's the best way to evaluate a drug and actually talk to the people involved. It really is important. So for example, when I do a study on Alzheimer's disease, I'm going to use the Wexler memory scale or the Bushy selective reminding test. And one of the folks in the meeting pointed out that actually if I ask the caregiver, does this person ask the same question less, and can this person tolerate when you leave the room for more than five minutes, I might have a much better drug cure. You know, so there's a lot of discussion going on about that, in particular around quality of life studies showing us Maybe what we should be asking better questions when we evaluate these drugs. Phases of, of treatment studies. This is, this is really important because this is the way you get a drug to market. And all the different studies going on now that you'll see if you sign up for trial match um, through the Alzheimer's Association or, or if you get asked to be in different, different studies, there are certain types of these studies, and, and you should understand this jargon because if somebody says, oh, I want you to be in this study, you need to make a choice between phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on. So a preclinical study is basically a laboratory-based study. Usually may, may or may not involve animals. My wife works, uh, used to work for Pfizer when I was still in Ann Arbor, and they used to do a tremendous amount of research just on the computer things that they would have taken years to do by animals, they can just do by mimicking what the results would be on the computer. But those are preclinical trials are supposed to tell you, does this drug look like it might not harm somebody? Then comes phase one trials. 
We used to do a lot of phase one trials here, which are always with health or usually with healthy people. It's the very first thing that goes on. Usually you take some healthy volunteers and you see what is this drug that we're pretty sure doesn't hurt people. What does it actually do if you give it to somebody? Also, for example, what happens if you give it to somebody and they decide to drink some alcohol? I know, by the way, if you want to sneak alcohol into somebody's drink without knowing it for sure, Michigan is the best place to do that because Michigan has burners. Uh, warm, fizzless burners will hide the taste of anything. I can tell you that from years of phase one trials. I can put any amount of vodka in there and, and the folks won't know. Sorry, I don't want you to go out and do that, but, it, but it's just, those are phase one trials. So it's actually important for phase one trials because what if you do have an alcohol interaction? That needs to be known before you ever look at it with, with people. Then phase two trials. These often involve a few hundred people and it provides further information that this is a group done with patients. This is the first time, so phase two trials are the first set of studies done with patients. Never a whole lot of people, and it's just more trying to figure out what dosage might work, does this actually look like a drug that can be used with patients, and so forth. Way back 30, 30 or so years ago when I was at Mount Sinai, we did a phase two trial of a drug that has now become Aricept, but in its earlier era, it was a drug you had to take every 45 minutes. Well, it was real clear from the first phase two trial we did that that was the dumbest idea we ever had, because you can't take it every 45 minutes, but we had to do a phase two trial to prove it. Phase three trials, these are the standard trials that you really are looking for that everybody wants to do now. These are the big giant trials. So these are large scale trials, thousands of people may be involved, usually at multiple sites around the world to be able to show what it's like to do this with a large population of people across different sites. And we'll talk about one of those trials in a little bit, but phase three trials are probably the critical trials because these are the ones that do safety. And sometimes the government says, I want you to do phase four trials. I want you to keep looking a little more carefully at what's happening. Or sometimes phase four trials are when you're looking at different combinations and things. But the big interest in the world is really phase two trials and phase three trials. So think about that when you see stuff in the newspaper, as you'll see more and more about different drug trials, phase two and phase three are very different. When somebody says in a phase two trial, we've shown this drug is incredibly effective for Alzheimer's, it means squat. Real, not true, I shouldn't say that, especially when I'm on being recorded, but, but but phase three trials, those are the ones that really tell us, is this an effective compound or not? There are two types of treatment trials also to keep your, your mind on too. There are trials aimed at reducing symptoms. So those would be the trials that we have now saying, how do we improve transmission so that people can remember things better? How do we improve those cells talking to each other a little bit better? How do we improve the, the, the symptoms of the disease? And then slowing or stopping the disease. That says that is the idea of preventing or stopping the disease. Those are two different types of trials. So remember when we showed that cascade before? This is where we are. We are right now at the bottom. This is where we want to be and we're slowly moving towards it. It's looking at, at true treatment trials. Now, do we have an effective treatment strategy? That's what we, well, that's where we sort of stand, and this is what everybody sort of looks at. So, if this is how, how your memory is working, higher the better, and this is time, this is pretty much what we all look like up there, and let's say this is roughly the natural course of Alzheimer's, the decline, right? So the terminology to remember is, what does a cure do? It brings you back to normal for your population. So treatment trials or curative trials. Arresting the progress of a disease is stopping it from getting any worse. The ideal time, of course, is a prevention trial before anything happens, right? 
This is where we are right now on symptom trials, which means the person gets better for a while, but eventually it stops working. Eventually the plaques and tangles get to be too much. So if, I, if I'm treating someone with uh, Aricept to improve the cholinergic system in the brain to get these cells to interact a little better, eventually the Alzheimer's will take such a toll that Aricept won't be effective anymore. There won't be enough cells to transmit. Same thing that happens in Parkinson's and cinnamon. Eventually there are no more dopamine reactive cells, not to the same extent, to be able to function. It may take years and years, but it still happens. So, now I want to cut to what I was asked to talk about, which was AEIC 2003 in Boston. I had more fun talking last year about France, but actually in some ways they didn't do nearly as much stuff in France. In some, well, they did a lot of stuff in France, which is more than they did with the year before, but in Boston there was a lot to do. And luckily I found this one little lunch place that had wonderful fish, this little tiny shack right by the place, so I really met the leaves, so it's kind of nice. So, the first thing I want to talk about is the, is the one really complicated thing I want to talk about, but it's worth talking about because this is a, a model that everybody talks about, is the Clifford Jack model. So the Clifford Jack model is the model that underlies everything we talked about a minute ago. Remember we talked about those plaques and tangles forming because the, the, um, the, the proteins don't break down things right and everything. So what the Clifford Jack model says, or back in 2010 and 2011 said, was you get this giant upswing in plaques. And then a little while later, you get these tangles that start to occur. And then you can see those tangles and you can see those imaging. So that the brain essentially fills full of plaques, which things like a PIP scanner, we'll talk about in a minute, or spinal fluid, A beta measures, measures of the amyloid in the brain, which show us changes dramatically earlier. And then all these other things like memory and the size of the hippocampus and other things lag behind, but if we could interfere with the plaque, we'd be, if we could interfere here, for example, we'd get things before things get back. Right? That is what we want to do. That's stop that cascade before it happens. Now things, this is essentially the same picture, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit more confusing because it turns out, remember there was that amyloid in tau? But then the Tau people got mad because they said we go first, and the Amway people said no, we go first, and there's a lot of arguing back and forth. And also people started realizing that rather than having one little line for cognition, cognition changes is, is a wide open thing. Some people show big changes, other people don't. So the green line for cognition got really wide depending upon if you have some risk factors or if you don't. That makes sense. So in other words, it's still the idea that this is a measure of amyloid in the, in the, in the CSF. This is a PID scan that we'll talk about that measures plaques in the brain. And these are these other parts that start to change too. The size of the hippocampus, the size of the, of the use of energy within the brain, but that essentially we're, we're looking at that change over time, with these guys still going, but maybe not so dramatically as before. Research is sort of suggesting that, that it's sort of gradual along all ways, and you, you start to see these plateaus. Now the only difference was that somebody pointed out, has been pointing out that, and it's a complicated thing, is that tau Remember the, when we talked about the tau that falls out of the cells that's so critical? It turns out that lots of people have tau in their brain. So it could be, possibly, that this tau, signified by this blue line, that may go very early on, but doesn't pop up here till it interacts with amyloid. So now there's a lot of rethinking of this and the role of tau and the role of amyloid 
but these pictures, they're complicated, but these pictures, but it all, the idea is everything is sort of a gradual slope, but the amyloid, the CSF, the tau come first before you see the behavioral signs, before the brain changes, before even maybe imaging, some types of imaging pick it up. You get these changes in the brain, so again, we're back to the fact is if you could interfere there and make a difference, you could make a difference. So another thing that came into a lot of discussion at, at the AAIC meeting, which last year here I glossed over, because frankly there wasn't that much more information out there about genetics, now the genetics issue has exploded, is the whole role, what is the role of genetics in Alzheimer's? So we sort of know two things. There are sporadic, late onset people who develop Alzheimer's in their 60s, and there's a very small group of people who develop it very young, in their 30s and 40s. So we know that that early onset group it's only about 2% of all the patients with Alzheimer's. We do know that they are truly genetic. It's autosomal dominant. If your family carries it, there's a 50% chance you're going to have it. And we pretty much know who those families are now around the world. Because everybody worked so hard over the past set of years to figure that out. It was a thing called the Diane study. It was really funded to a great extent from the Alzheimer's Association which was to say, find the folks who seem to have, who seem to develop Alzheimer's early on. Because if we could find them and understand what's going on, we could treat them, we could treat them before they have all sorts of other problems like atherosclerosis and heart disease and other things, they might be the perfect group for us to start with. So we know that that group is very heavily related to genetics, but we also know that the majority of other folks, by far the vast number of other folks who develop Alzheimer's disease, may have some genetic factors. Now we're learning more and more that there's much more genetics involved, but that other things are going on. There's something at play in the environment. There's something at play that's triggering that change in the York. So when you hear about genes and Alzheimer's, these are sort of the genes you, you hear about. These are, the, these are the, the four genes that everybody talks about. Amyloid precursor protein gene, which was, which was discovered in 1987. It really is the gene that, that, that started a lot of the interest in Alzheimer's. Presilin 1 and 2, which are the genes that cause, that we know cause early onset Alzheimer's. If somebody carries those genes and we can track those genes through genetic coding now, we know they will develop Alzheimer's. APOE4 was the gene in 1993 that was found. It was the first gene known to simply increase the risk of Alzheimer's. It was the very first gene, and people used to, well, it seems to increase the risk, but I don't know, it increases the risk. Honestly, it increases the risk of all sorts of things. But it, it got a lot of interest. But those types of genes fit into one of these two categories. And this is where all the genetic research is going right now. Risk genes, like ApoE4, and like another one we'll talk about in a minute, are genes that seem to affect the appearance of Alzheimer's or the course of Alzheimer's. These are risk genes. And then the other ones are determinant genes, deterministic genes. These are the ones that cause it. If you've got it, you're going to get it. These are the ones that cause familial Alzheimer's. Nobody's figured out a deterministic gene up here, although people are looking like crazy, but nobody's ever found it, and they probably won't. But we do know that early, in early onset Alzheimer's, in those small group of people with early onset, it is very genetic based. But again, we, we know probably most of those families, many of those families. Like that. So really, the pool of all sorts of genes it's, it's gigantic. We know APOE is, is a main one, but now there, there was another article in the paper, I think last week, there's like 24 new genes identified involved in Alzheimer's. The point about all this stuff is, you're looking, what everybody's trying to do is predict who has the highest risk of Alzheimer's, right? Because if you can predict who has the highest risk, you can interfere early on. Because 
now you can say this person has a risk matrix. Maybe you give them a, a, a scan or another test that says they have the biomarkers, they have plaques and tangles in their brain. Then you can treat that person and see if they develop Alzheimer's. Then they, they develop the clinical pictures of Alzheimer's. So genes have now been found to be critically important as ways that we can talk about. So genes have different effects. So here's the effect of APOE. We know that APOE increases the risk of Alzheimer's, but it doesn't really figure into the disease until somebody has amyloid in the brain. So once you get amyloid in the brain, APOE, whether you have, whether you're a carrier or a non-carrier, they have the same pattern, it's just that when you have the E4 gene, when you have the APOE gene, you have a faster descent. Okay? But whether you have it or not, it's, it's the same. Whether you're a carrier or not, once you have high amyloid, you go down. But the APOE gene seems to take you faster and seems to, does seem to increase the chance that you may have <coughs> APOE. But there's all sorts of other studies. This other study that just uh, came out at the at the uh, at the um, at the AAIC meeting was really important because the don't bother reading it, but the, you know reading the whole thing. But the main thing is what they found was a whole set of genes that appeared to relate to the rate of decline. Why are we doing all this stuff? Because we have the human genome. We can look at all these genes now, which we never could before. This is a massive undertaking, but now the they have the computers that can look at this, they can look at the genetic, make genetic makeup of thousands upon thousands of people and look for who develops what patterns and why. But one of the studies that came out said, and this was a study that looked at a, you know, over a thousand people and looked at their genetic coding and said, look, we found that the people who decline fastest seem to have this cluster of genes. If we knew that ahead of time for people, if we could show that those are risks, then maybe these are people we should start thinking about treating, or at least watching much more carefully for the not changes. That's how we saw that you have in this. I mean, the number one rule of science is correlations without you no know, causality. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll actually I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. But for the risk of this one, I don't remember. You could you'd have to look at the study, but but certainly. There was a high pattern with these because of human genomics. And the, the issue with human genomics is you're looking at, uh, at thousands of people, so there is more chance for significance when you look at thousands of people, but it's driven by the effect size. And the effect sizes are substantial enough that it gets published. So I don't, I don't know the exact ones, honestly. Well, I'll just say, you know, there's a lot of genes on the same chromosome. So yeah. Could you have to say this animal is right here and blonde hair is up here? So right. you say, here's blonde hair, here's the first one with uh, your disease. Right. Obviously, blonde so hair is do that? Together. Right. So how do you do that? You get thousands upon thousands of people from all different makeups. Okay. So well, I do a lot of research. Like to say, well, you're better your eyes. Right. So I do a lot of research in Africa. I had a whole bunch of my friends in Alzheimer's shot last summer because there was Bruno in my little grubby clothes, you know, hanging around in Africa, and they all showed up in their suits because they wanted to start a genetic group with, with, the, with the African, with the folks in Uganda to try and get samples for the GWAS code, because that would introduce a whole new spectrum of people. Why did that turn out not to be a good idea? What's the, we know that age is the best predictor of Alzheimer's disease. How long does somebody live in Africa? Mid-50s. So it doesn't, it didn't work, it wouldn't work. But here's just another, here's an example of another gene that suddenly people have gotten really interested in. This is the BDNF gene. There's a lot of interest in BDNF hormones, but in one of the genes that affects it, there's a lot of interest because it looks like people who carry the gene, once they have high data, they have high number of plaques, of noticeable plaques, not high number, noticeable plaques in the brain. Having that BDNF gene really seems to drive them quickly down the hill. So again, it's all of this stuff is the thought or the association thereof, back to your issue, that these things seem to be related.
but you can't check it. You can't do it until you do a prospective study ahead of time. So we'll talk about that, but that's where a lot of these things are going. So let's talk, I want to talk a little bit about, because folks always ask me to talk a little bit about what are the new drugs, and where, what, what's going on in, in, the, in the drugs, and the sort of where we stand with drugs and things. And, and these are the drugs we're using now for Alzheimer's disease, right? Somebody's going to wave at me at some point, right? Oh, she is up there? I'm never going to see her up there. So then we'll just ignore her and I'll just keep talking. So these are the, top, these are the drugs we have now. Tacrin, denethacyl, ribostigmine, and galantamine, and, and uh, memento. These, these, me, these are the drugs that we're currently using and we've been using for a long time. And this, tacrin, is the drug I was studying back in the 70s. You know, so these are have been there for a long time, but unfortunately, they're again they're just helping us along with the symptoms. We still are looking at the new drugs, but there were some interesting findings with these new drugs because all of this is back to the point: was well, success successful prevention has to mean we have to move this drug line way back here to be able to prevent the disease and the. The other thing is that what we're finding is, for a lot of these studies, in the past we've said, okay, we're only going to do the study on somebody with moderate to severe Alzheimer's or mild to moderate Alzheimer's because that's the diagnostic category. But what people are beginning to say is, look, it's like Parkinson's. People have already lost those cells. The amyloid is already up there and done its damage. We need to intersect early on. We need to be down here providing drug trials. So that's where a lot of the research is changing, and that's new this year. A lot of interesting discussion. So what are the targets? The first target is still the obvious target, right? Beta amyloid. People still want to try to figure out how can we understand how to attack that. So a lot of interest in that beta and gamma secretase. Remember those things that were snipping? Suddenly people are going back and saying, Okay, we tried vaccinating the brain to get it to throw out uh, amyloid. I talked about that last year, that that was a big interest, was IVIG, was that we're now we're going to, we, we've got a mouse model of Alzheimer's, and when that little mouse develops Alzheimer's, we stick him with this vaccine, and poof, the brain is clean. Unfortunately, humans didn't quite work. Um, and, and it either created more problems than it did, but there's still research going on, but still, it doesn't seem to be the key. So now people are going back and saying, wow, we can't just get rid of amyloid. We need to look at how to stop it from, from happening so that those enzymes are becoming of much more interest. Tau. Suddenly, people are becoming much more interested in tau. Aside from most of my friends at University of Michigan are tau guys who think the amyloid guys are all wrong because they say, look, amyloid occurs, and yet, when somebody has even a lot of amyloid in the brain, they may not show any cognitive difficulties. But once there's tau evident, they go downhill. So how do you guys know it's not really the amyloid, but it's the tau that's doing it? So now there's a, the problem is tau is a much harder thing to look at, much more complicated, much harder to identify and mark. But now there's a lot more interest in tau. Inflammation. Inflammation for a while, there got to be real interest in inflammation. Then it sort of died away, and people were saying, oh, they were trying to take Advil or other ACE inhibitors and things. But now there's a lot more interest in inflammation, in particular because of relationships between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. So a lot more interest in looking at that. And the whole issue of insulin resistance, too, the idea that there's something in the way that brain cells process insulin that might be, be associated with dementia, might be associated with Alzheimer's. So these are the new areas where you'll be hearing about people starting to look at the research. So a lot of the drug discussions at AEIC this year, and remember, that's the only conference exclusively for people who study Alzheimer's. It's thousands of people who study Alzheimer's. That's the, and that was those, it was these things, frankly, that were the big issue. And we'll talk about that in a minute because the amyloid studies have been decided upon. They're going on. If the amyloid studies fail, what are we going to do? If the amyloid
drug studies don't work the way they haven't worked till now, first of all, are the drug companies going to still be interested in doing studies? And how fast can we say, okay, we, we need to look at some of these other ideas? So these other ideas are where some of the studies are going. I need to remit, I want to mention the IVIG before. This was an immunization study that was done using mouse amyloid dependent, trying to, to essentially force the brain to get rid of the amyloid on its own. The initial studies that were presented at last year's Alzheimer's Association meeting were all negative, caused the stock to plummet. Pfizer barely survived in some ways, because they were part of the biggest. Uh, um, investor there. But there was some thought that, okay, it doesn't look like it worked, but, but it seems to work, seems to work with people who have the APOE4 gene. So in the past 18 months or so since the last meeting, there's been a lot more discussion about this, and people have been on the drug for longer, and it looks like there might be some ideas that, that it might work. What I didn't mention to you, I forgot that I, I didn't put the slide in there, was there's, there's here's, the, here's the thing about drug studies. Just like back to the issue of, of a whole bunch of genes, we're psychologists, neuropsychologists, and neurologists, we just love to ask a million questions. We just can't get by with one test. We gotta add 300 tests. But the minute you do 300 tests or whatever, one is bound to be just by chance turn out, right? So, what the government says is, eh, 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 eh. if you want this drug in use, you give me your primary endpoint. If you want to look at some secondary endpoints later on to tell you about the drug and stuff, that's fine with me. Maybe they'll give you important information you can use in a new study, but your drug is, is, is approved or not on your primary endpoint. So what happened with IVIG was they had these two measures, ADOS cognition and this ADL, which is a functions of daily living scale. Those were the primary endpoints. They showed no change whatsoever compared to placebo. So the drug failed. But now they're going back and saying, well, wait a minute. If I look at certain types of higher level skills, so problem solving things, not just memory, it looks like I may be seeing improvements. The government says, of course, that's nice and interesting, but you gotta do another study and say maybe that's what you want to prove. But the other thing is I just came back from some, some meetings in Washington, and the government says, the people who make the decisions in the FDA say, yeah, but you gotta improve memory. Nice to see you improve these other things, but if you're not improving memory, you're not really improving Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of discussion about that. But anyway, the one thing that comes out of all these studies is that an active and an inactive uh, vaccine, like IVIG, does look like it can target amyloid. And it looks like the antibodies do reach the brain, so it looks like it might, these type of things still might be effective, it's just that IVIG doesn't look like it's the one that's going to a couple of other drugs to mention because they're of real interest are MK8931 was, is, is, will appear in a couple of the pre prevention trials I'm going to mention to you. This was a drug that had some real interest in, at AAIC because what does it do? It's a base one. It's one, it, 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 it tries to inhibit beta secretase. Remember? We talked about the wrong snipping. It tries to get in there and kick out beta secretase. So this has become a real interest. Before, people weren't paying much, much attention to it and saying, oh, we want to do these vaccine studies. Now people are coming back and saying, maybe we need to, need to look at that. And a first study presented there showed that it did, in a phase two trial, look like it might be having some effects. So it's going to phase three. They're going to look at this in a much bigger picture. So remember, you do the first the small studies, then you do the big ones. But we do have some evidence that that might be a way. This is another drug that looks at brain inflammation. And what this one, again, was the first study that's really shown that maybe some of these neuro inhibitors actually might improve cognition. But again, it looks like it's just the people that carry the ApoE4 gene. 
So that APOE4 gene is more and more beginning to look like some sort of a risk factor that pushes folks towards Alzheimer's, but in the way of the pipe. How are you doing? Oh, I see. I'm almost done. Um, that's become a big interest. So let me tell you about these last two, and then we're done with all this stuff. Because this is interesting. This is the clincher. This is right where we are now, and this is the big interest. And this is a ton of talk, both based on the meetings I was at in Washington all last week, as well as because we're still trying, I mean, people are still trying to determine what these studies will actually be. This is the test of amyloid. This is it. These studies are going to start, they're going to last four to five years, and if they work, we've got a cure. If they don't, we're back to the drawing boards. These are prevention trials. So these are the trials that say we want to prevent it before it happens. So they're not looking at Alzheimer's patients, they're looking at those at risk. So and this, is, this is really big stuff. The A4 trial, which we're doing at the University of Michigan, is looking at a monoclonal antibody, which similar to, to IVIG, which basically will take normal people over age 65, that's going to be 79, I think it's back to 65, who are amyloid positive by biomarker. So that study will be offering people PIP scans that we'll talk about in a minute, which look at the brain to determine how much amyloid is in the brain. And essentially will tell a person, look, you've got a lot of amyloid in the brain, I would like to put you in this study. This is a very interesting study because what is it doing? You are imparting I mean, from a risk standpoint, it's, it's, it's very interesting because you're essentially saying to somebody, your brain is full of amyloid, you're probably going to get Alzheimer's, but you may have nothing wrong with you right now. I mean, that's a rough issue to face, but this is what science is saying we have to do. But, you know, you'll be then separating people into those with and those without. So if you're in the study, you know what's in your brain. You may not know the extent of it, but you know what's in the brain. But that's the only way to do it, because then if we know that if you have amyloid in the brain and the expectation is you're going to develop Alzheimer's within, let's say, five years, if you don't, we've found a way to slow it or to stop it. It will be incredible. The API trial is another trial with, a, with an antibody, Canuzlovab, which, which is going to take cognitively normal people who are part of this incredibly high genetic risk group in, in Colombia. So these are folks who carry that early onset gene in a very tight-knit population that, that live on this, in this essentially on this, uh, over this uh, lake. They live over the lake. And uh, it's a difficult study because there, there's actually a local doctor who's been studying them for, for a long, many, many years and for a long time tried to get folks in this country to look at these individuals because he thought there's something terribly wrong with these folks. Well, what it turns out is they all are developing Alzheimer's by age of about 35 or 40. So those that carry the gene. So this study actually will take folks and they already have started for many in Colombia, fly them up for all these different scans and things, start them on drug, and see how long it does. Now let me tell you, this one was fraught with all sorts of issues. Now you're asking people to give consent who have lived on a little island, you know, and things, except what happens, they look at their family and they go, yes. You know, that's the point. You have, if you have this genetic strain in your family, you want a drug. You just want it, period. Because that's the best word. So these things are really, but they are important and clear issues that have to be thought about in terms of, you know, what's appropriate and what's not. The other two studies are the Diane 2 study, which is now, which will be in, which will be in people across the world who have the early onset gene. They've been studied for years by the Alzheimer's Association and others, has collected these individuals, and, and it's going to say to these individuals, you have the option of entering this trial if you want, you have a high risk of Alzheimer's. We're going to give you this drug which we don't think will hurt you, but we can't guarantee it, but we're hoping it by, by it, your age it will tell us how to do it. And the last study is the tomorrow study, which 
Kathy Walsh Bonner, a friend of mine, is, is running, which is looking at, it's interesting because this is one trial that's not looking at, at healthy normals who go on to develop problems. This is looking to, um, I'm sorry, this is looking at that, but the whole deal is stop MCI rather than Alzheimer's disease, stop healthy normals from developing mild cognitive impairment. So this is the first trial specifically around mild cognitive impairment. So the endpoint is not dementia, which is in the other trials. The endpoint, the primary outcome in this trial is mild cognitive impairment. And they're using two genes that seem to be at risk, the APOE4 and the TOM40 genes, that seem to be ones that put people at risk. So again, these are interesting trials, but this is it. These are amyloid drugs. If they don't work, in the first three, or if this one doesn't work, and, the, and this is pioglitazone, which is that drug I mentioned that, that is a type 2 diabetes drug, but it's still affecting amyloid. If these, two, if these things don't work, we're back to the drawing forms. The tower guys will smile, but we're back to the drawing forms. Yeah? Is there an area of the world where uh, there's a significantly decreased amount of uh, Alzheimer's? There, there seem to be clusters. So in Kenya, there's a group of people that live into their late, I mean not late, but their, their early hundreds, whatever, 105, 110, and so forth, who don't seem to, have, seem to have an incredibly low level. There's a little village in Italy where nobody gets Alzheimer's, you know, who live very late in life so that there should be a significant percentage they don't. So what, there's a lot of people interested in those little clusters of people. But, but there, it's not a clear pattern of, of why. There's been a lot of interest, for example, in, in a couple of, of tribes up in um, a couple of uh, familial clusters in the Andes, because they have no outside input. They have, they're pretty much set away from everything, so trying to look at their percentages of Alzheimer's. So how do they develop Alzheimer's if they don't have all the lead and all the other stuff floating around, too? So there's some of them as well. I just throw this up right before the break because this got a lot of press recently. Drink hot cocoa to improve brain power because everybody knows that, and, and there has been certainly the influence that if you eat chocolate with, with uh, you know, that the, the, uh, chocolate should help you with the, its antioxidants. So there was this great study that came out where they had everybody drink two cups of hot cocoa every day. Interesting thing was they thought they had the idea was that the flavanol that said chocolate was the key, hot chocolate was the key, it, so they had a group with and without that. It turned out both groups did better on hot chocolate. So I guess the question is, you know, that everybody was saying go out and drink hot chocolate. And it's good for you now, and, and it doesn't make any difference whether it has flavanol or not in it. But the point is, of course, what happens if you drink two cups of hot chocolate every day, you're going to get type 2 diabetes. Um, or, or there are all sorts of other problems, and then somebody else pointed out the amount of caffeine these folks are ingesting is pretty significant too in the chocolate, so maybe that's the effect. But again, with all these studies, these are little tiny phase two studies or phase one studies. You don't get anything until you do a big study that's prospective. Okay, so um, I, I, I just mention this study all the time because I please I ask you, don't go on the internet and buy things. They all look great. Um, and these are some of the sort of classic uh, internet meds that are making a fortune. My favorite, of course, I always like to point out, is Dr. Christopher, Christopher's memory pills. It's for men only. I don't know why, but it's for men only. And, and Axona is really interesting because Axona actually was a drug that failed in studies. And they, because it's a natural product, they turned it into a nutraceutical, and they did it very effectively by saying, oh, you can't, we can't give it to, him, to you unless you have a doctor's prescription. The, the biomarker is the big interest in the blood, and is, is the issue of trying to reproduce in the blood what we see in the spinal column, the, but it's very hard to do, and nobody's made that connection. The problem with doing looking at CSFs cerebral spinal fluid is Americans just don't want to do it. You, know, you just don't want to have a spinal work. It's a lot easier now than it ever was before, but I just can't explain that to people. 
I can tell you that my friends in Amsterdam look at me like I'm an idiot and go, well, I tell, I tell my patients to do it, and they do it right away. They have unbelievable research there and data because they're doing the spiral is like no big thing, but it just depends upon, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest or whatever it is. You know, there, there are lots of reasons why they don't do it here. So there, although there's a lot of interest in it, and still the push in it, a lot of the work is really going towards bio, bio. In, in terms of biomarkers right now, it's going towards imaging. And, and imaging right now is led by ADNI. And ADNI is the Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, which is now in ADNI 2. It, like those other studies I mentioned, sucks up a tremendous amount of research dollars. But it is incredible what ADNI has given us. It's just unbelievable the amount of data ADNI has given us in these, for the genetic studies, for the imaging studies, and for everything else. So I can't fault big research uh, for that one. It really has been interesting. So ADNI has, has um, over a thousand people enrolled in it now. It follows people for a whole different type, set of types of imaging that I'll show you. And, and uh, most of the data I will demo, I'll show you comes from ADNI trials or related trials and things with ADNI. So this is a major initiative, really, which was pushed by the Alzheimer's Association, because the Alzheimer's Association decided that there was just simply no reason why you couldn't force people to sit down at a table together. So that's where I was with la last week. I was, with, as at, I was at the Alzheimer's disease. I made a presentation at the at the Alzheimer's Association's roundtable, which are these meetings they have where they bring in researchers and they bring in, in people from pharma and they bring in government people and they force us to sit down together for a couple days and talk to each other. Very interesting meeting, um, just for what happens. But ADNI had all sorts of pieces. Had had um, a PIB set, which we'll talk about, spinal fluid exceptions, it's now tied directly into the genome analysis and, and, and genome work, so everybody gets blood who's part of it, and all their genetic information is stored. This is a massive study going on across, across not across the United States, and Ann Arbor's in there somewhere um, up here, so, whoops, that one went by fast, but there we are in there somewhere, because um, we are in Anthony's site. And now ADNI is all around the world. So there are whole sets of studies being done. And the beauty of this is every site should theoretically be able to share data as if you were there. Everybody loves to say, oh, those silly people, they give memory tests. I can do the memory test here, and it's not the same over there. But if I give somebody an MRI scan, ooh, I could go to Japan and get the same MRI scan. You can forget it. The, the machines are different, the images are different, there is no real consistency across, but what ADNI is forcing is consistency across. So the way you do that is you have a, you essentially have a pretend head called a ghost. You stick it in the, you stick it in your machine and everybody has to have the exact same MRI scan with the exact same PET scan with that pretend head and then you know you can share data. And the same thing with the CSF, with spinal fluid. You know that the analysis is going to be exactly the same because it's all done in the same lab. So this is what Abby has done in being able to link all of these groups together is phenomenal. And some of these groups are really doing a lot of work. The Japanese doing a lot of work in sort of high standard functional imaging, fancy types of imaging. The um, Australia Abby group, a bunch of my friends, are there doing a lot of work where they're really interested in figuring out what are the earliest signs of cognitive change. And, and uh, for example, the ADNI Australia group is called ABLE, which is the uh, Australian Imaging Biomarkers and Lifestyle Study. But um, and I think I spelled ABLE wrong. But, but anyway, um, so what they've already, they've shown a number of things in their recent research, even faster in some ways than the US got stuff out. But what they've shown, for one thing, is once you begin to see beta amyloid in the brain with some of the imaging stuff I'll show you, it takes over 10 years to reach a point where somebody would say it's an abnormal amount. So it's a very slow gain of amyloid. But this is critically important. Because then we know it may occur very early on. Remember those crazy little things I showed you, those 
those signs, those things may occur very far in before they become clinically evident. So amyloid may be growing there a lot of times. And it takes on average about 19 years to reach the level that would be called Alzheimer's. And, and changes in, in the hippocampus occur about five years before you see dementia. So again, amyloid deposit rates among study participants were very similar to rates. This is the most critical thing that add, one of the most critical things that the ABLE study is doing because there are a number of early onset families in Australia and others that they've looked at. They're demonstrating that with their imaging, there's basically no difference in the imaging between the early onset and the, the late onset of Alzheimer's. Which is critical, again, to be able to say we can study people with early onset to help us understand late onset. So these are all these, I mean, I could show you this for Japan, I could show you it for Austria, I could show you it for the U.S. The, the ADNI thing is amazing, and it wouldn't be here without the Alzheimer's Association, I can absolutely guarantee you, it wouldn't have been. So, imaging technology is used in Alzheimer's research, you're asking about, about the different types. There's structural imaging that provides information about the shape, the volume of the brain tissue, that's usually MRI or CT, of, most of us in here may have already had an MRI or CT of the brain or the leg or whatever. Functional imaging tells us how well cells in various regions of the brain are working by showing us how they use oxygen and sugar and such. And molecular imaging that shows us what happens when we use highly targeted radio tracers to look at direct chemical changes like amyloid deposits in the brain. So it's the molecular ones that are, that are the real key that we want to talk about. But I can show you some of the things in structural imaging. In uh, Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of interest in brain shrinkage and being able to look at that. Differences between controls and patients with Alzheimer's, you can see the differences in the brain, as well as now being able to say we can use it over time to monitor how the brain changes and we think that if we find the right drug, for example, we might be able to show that people with the right drug don't show these changes. Now that ADNI has amassed such a large number of people, that we know the standard of what changes are like. So now when we, we do drug trials, we can apply that standard. So the structural studies are really important. Some of the structural studies also have gotten so fancy and so exacting that they can even show intervention changes. They can show changes of drugs. This was a study trying to show changes from normal when people walked in healthy aging, as well as in cognitive impairment, showing that you can show significant changes and even show them on the structure of the brain that with something as simple as exercise, the very structure of the brain can change. Functional imaging are the PET studies and things I talked about. So these are essentially showing us how the brain uses energy. So structural studies are important to show us what the brain looks like. So it can show us the holes that develop as cells die. Functional imaging shows us what's happening to those cells before they die, when, it, when they stop using energy. So functional imaging is really important for showing us what happens in, in in the normal course of the disease. So this, for example, is a patient, a healthy control. The more red it is, the more different it is from normal. I mean, the, excuse me, the more red, the more activity. And you can see that there's a slight, hardly any changes here. There's some changes from not as quite as much red, but look at the difference in a, in a late Alzheimer's disease. You can also look at a healthy control a patient with mild cognitive impairment who's not yet diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and a patient with Alzheimer's. What you see here is practically identical here, and yet here, a real difference between the normal and the patient with mild cognitive impairment. So the suggestion that even some mild cognitive impairment patients may show significantly earlier differences in how the brain uses sugar, how the brain uses energy. As a matter of fact, there's a study that, that was done as part of the ADNI study that says that if you do a brain scan of uh, patients with a PET scanner, you may, may be able to say who's going to convert within six months or 12 months. The importance of this is, again, is all this work is sort of headed towards clinical trials. 
if I can predict who looks like they might be changing or who might not, then I might change my sample even more. So a lot of these, having been able to do these kind of fine grained things is critically important. And a lot of studies that have now shown that as you become more impaired, more and more of the brain is involved by using less and less energy, you can now track effect of different medications. And as a matter of fact, Babinuzinap was a drug that was uh, studied by Pfizer. An awful lot of money went in Babinuzinap. Again, it failed because its primary endpoints were not reached. It was a million point, well, a billion point one dollars for a study that failed. And yet, you know, when you looked at, at the, the, the um, people treated by Babinuzinap and people not, it really looked like there were some changes. That actually the, the PET imaging showed there were some changes. So again, this called upon questions like, should we really be dumping a drug because its primary thing doesn't work? Maybe we should be looking at, at other things. Now the government comes back to the point of, if Alzheimer's is a memory loss drug, is a drug, you have to show it works. I don't much care what you do in the brain. I want to see the behavior change. These are things that are in discussion, addressing issues. Pet imaging is used a lot. FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, how the brain uses energy, tells us a lot about how different disorders occur. This is an Alzheimer's patient showing a characteristic, what's called temporal parietal change. So these are changes from normal. This part of the brain right here is becoming abnormal. This is the part of the brain that deals with memory. And you can see the front part of the brain is beginning to change as well. You can compare that to a patient with frontal temporal dementia, a dementia that just starts and tends to stay in the front of the brain. So you can see that the Alzheimer's patient is beginning to show some changes. But look at the dramatic difference. There's no changes from normal in the back, but big changes in Alzheimer's. This is a patient with mild Alzheimer's disease who's just beginning to show those characteristic changes. Compare patients with Lewy body disease, other types of disorders with, with this type of imaging. As it becomes more and more available, uh, it, it'll at least help us by saying if you come in with a memory problem, can we tell you what it is? Because what we give somebody with Alzheimer's disease does not help, help somebody with frontal temporal dementia and vice versa. So part of this is really important when somebody first comes in because now we're tuning so early by saying, what's your first symptoms? The problem is, if I say I have a memory problem, that could be a memory problem because I'm, I'm developing Alzheimer's disease and I can't remember, or a memory problem because I have frontal temporal dementia because I can't organize my memory. Different issues, different problems. There are lots of things that lead to that. So PET scan may be important. Molecular imaging. Um, this is really the key of, as I mentioned, where things are. The Pittsburgh compound was the first radio tracer that, that really found beta amyloid. Steve Dukoski in, in Pittsburgh led a whole set of studies to, to really look at this compound. This is an incredibly complex compound to make, but it's unbelievable what it shows. And we'll look at some pictures. Now there are about three more compounds in, under FDA review. To, that are, that are um, also purporting to do the same thing, but a little easier. Flute, for example, is a compound that stays much more stable. In order to do a PIP scanner, you have to be like us, you have to have a cyclotron. You have to make the stuff right there. And it lasts about, you know, a matter of minutes. So you've got to make the stuff, stick it in the person, and look and see what you have. I can't drive it over to uh, Farmington Hills or something. So flute lasts longer. Um, Amvid, some of these other ones also appear to last longer. They're all different ways of doing it, but they're all out to measure it beta amyloid because we know right now that's where all the interest is. It's also the easiest thing to, to measure. These are examples of that. This is a, um, a PIB negative individual, and, and this is, uh, the, this is the, again, the Pittsburgh compound showing essentially the brighter it is, the more, more amyloid in the brain. This is sort of a classic pattern, very little amyloid deposit. 
This is somebody who's PID positive and essentially normal. This is a patient with Alzheimer's. The redder, the more involved. You can see this is a brain full of amyloid, especially where? Right here and right here. Classic pattern of where the, the amyloid is. But again, the PID positive elderly, supposedly normal, are showing early changes. The question is, of course, does that necessarily lead to Alzheimer's? Well, that's an interesting problem because here is the, the, the million dollar question, maybe million dollar question, whatever it is. These are healthy control. These are patients with Alzheimer's with the PIP scanner. See how bright it is. 80% of normals look totally different. 20% of normals look just like those guys up there. 20% of us are wandering around with amyloid in the brain. Does that mean we're going to get Alzheimer's disease? Or does it mean we have to have something that triggers it? We just don't know. That's where the big interest is. That's why all these new upcoming studies are really interested in this group of people. Can we make the amyloid go away? Should we be treating it? If we make it go away, will they get Alzheimer's disease or not? These are really big hot topics. But this compound that's come out in the past six, seven years or so, whatever, is critical in doing this. Yeah. at NIH, there's a heck of a lot of people looking at those people, that 20% of the people. What, what does PID stand for? Pittsburgh compound. Oh, okay. There's also ScanVid, the Scandinavian compound. Okay. They're also in the running for it's the Nobel Prize. Okay. Yeah, the, the Scandinavians say they did it first. Steve Dukoski and the Pittsburgh people said they did it first. So, you know, they'll share a Nobel Prize maybe someday or something. <laughs> now, the other thing I want to mention that just came out at, this also came at, at this year's meeting that nobody had really been talking about other than in whispered tones was two possible tau markers. So this stuff is still in early stages, but it looks like it looks like there may be tau markers. And it's interesting that the tau markers seem to light up different things that, it, that, that amyloid light up. In other words, we know that amyloid hits certain areas of the brain, and then the brain starts to fall apart in the hippocampus, and the tau becomes more involved. So that the tau markers, a lot of people are saying, we really want to know about that, because maybe that's the thing that will really tell us, A, whether we're really effective in changing memory or changing with, with the drug or not, or maybe it'll tell us something about the trigger, we just don't know. But at this point, you only have amyloid markers. Now we have amyloid and tau markers. So this will be, this will be, and this just came out this year. There's a lot of other studies that were done, a lot of studies saying if we look at both cognitive testing and PID testing, we can be even more exact towards what we want. So people are saying that if we're going to do a prevention trial, maybe we, we, we should be. So there's a, remember those prevention trials I mentioned, there's still discussions going on about what tests they should be using and how they should be enriching their samples. So a lot of these different studies came out with it. And I want to talk about something else that I think is really critical. Isn't maybe that sexy to some folks um, in the business, but it's really, really critical are these large data studies. Until this time, there were tons of, of um, the Framingham, the Framingham Heart Study is a good example of that. Studying people in Framingham, Massachusetts to see what the, what the cardiovascular uh, issues are, what gives limbs towards cardiovascular problems. Huge, massive study. Nobody bothered to add any testing to it in the past few years. Now they're beginning to add cognitive testing to it. There's never been the money to do a study of just cognitive testing until ADNI came along, but ADNI too is not is a is a volunteer-based study. It's not like Framingham that took everybody. You know, so there's still so, but these big these big data studies are beginning to appear now that are people who've started incorporating cognitive testing into their studies, where where before they didn't. 
Like, for example, oops. For, and and well, here's the reason why, by the way. That it's important to do, this is what a long-term trajectory of memory looks like. Well, it's actually a test for meaning, sorry. This is a Ken Wilson study in which they looked at longitudinally what the change was. But if they looked at a whole bunch of people at different ages, they got a decline with age. But it turns out if you looked at the same person declining, it would have been very different. So rather than trying to do all these different studies where we just bring a whole bunch of people in at different ages, what this says is you've got to do longitudinal change because the same person changes over time very differently than if you bring a whole bunch of people in at different ages. So these longitudinal studies are the key. And this is the results of the Seattle, the Seattle longitudinal study where they are suggesting that in their large cohort of thousands of people that they've been looking at in Seattle, they can almost suggest that those who develop dementia compared to those who remain without dementia, that they can begin to see changes in people when they're 40 and 50. Because by looking longitudinally, you're looking at the same person over and over again, the statistics you use are much more powerful too. So you get a better curve and you get a better picture. So these big studies, this is a study we did, um, looking at a, a large cohort of people on the telephone. So they were telephone tested every, every year. And, and actually, when we've looked at the people who have gone on to pass away, with, um, a high percentage of these individuals had Alzheimer's disease. And you can see that it, at about year four, they all started healthy. But by about year four, we had begun to see differences. So the question would be in all these different studies, are there ways we can use this to enrich clinical trials? by the side looking just at genes and other things, by beginning to say, who might be starting to have difficulties? The diabetes treatment and Alzheimer's risk study is a really interesting study that, that was done that looked at type 2 diabetes. We know that type 2 diabetes doubles the risk of dementia of some type. Of some type. So we know type 1 is type 2 is the one that's been the key. And I, I don't think type 1 has nearly the same. Yeah, yeah, no, there's, this is type 2, but it's only doubling the risk. It's not really that big of a difference, but it is doubling the risk. But in this large study of type 2 diabetes patients that were on single therapy, they found that it made a difference what drug the person was on. Those taking insulin or TZD had a very different risk pattern than others. So now there's people beginning to say, whoa, we know that... So, so now when you do these big longitudinal studies like this and you follow people for a long time, I mean, we're talking about 15,000 people here, you can suddenly begin to see patterns that really come through as really important. So it may not just be that, that type 2 diabetes increases the risk. It may actually be that that's driven by some factor which is in there that some people are or aren't, or aren't using a certain type of meds. This is... You know, you don't know for sure. These are retrospective studies. Nobody's done a prospective study. But still, there's some suggestion, and all you can say is it's a suggestion that this may be something. The nurse's health study. Here's was another study that nobody bothered to think about adding cognition to it that had been going on looking at nurses' health over time. Now they've started adding cognition. One of the things they started adding right away was subjective uh, cognitive difficulties. What if the nurses reported having cognitive difficulties? And what if they were told there's nothing wrong with you? What if you tracked those people over time? And when they did that, they found that first of all, people tracked over time who reported having problems had higher levels of beta amyloid in the brain when you gave them scans. And in when an even bigger study was done, and divided people in APOE4 or not, asked them certain questions, it looked like APOE4, if, if an APOE4 carrier, a person who had the APOE4 gene, had one concern, they, they were headed towards Alzheimer's faster. If a non-carrier had three concerns, that was about the same risk level. So again, it shows you the importance of APOE4 potentially as a marker, Potentially, it shows you also potentially the importance of just asking somebody, how do you think you're doing? 
and not disregarding them when they say, I don't think I'm doing well. Uh, subjective cognitive difficulties. There's subjective cognitive difficulties, subjective memory complaints. I'm sorry, everybody, yeah, but I, no, everybody's got a different terminology. Yeah. They just, oh, no, I, and I can never remember which one I'm using at the time, because everybody uses a different one. The retirement age and dementia risk, this is another interesting study done. Again, this is a study done of 429,000 people. The other thing you'll start to see about a lot of these studies is they're done in France and Belgium and Scandinavia because we don't track people here. They do there routinely, we don't track people. But in this big study, that's why more and more we're relying on, we're relying on Europeans to do these studies because they do they give everybody scans, they do all these things, they don't have insurance issues the way we do, but still it's interesting. In this study, they found that retirement at an older age was associated with reduced risk of dementia. But those people who retired at a later age were more involved in activities as well. So was it really that they were just more involved in activities or they were still working? You know, when I retire, I'm sitting on the couch, but that was right. <laughs> Cancer and dementia risk. These studies now, the VA Boston Healthcare System, they have this study, I mean, this immense study of veterans, because at least the veterans keep track of themselves. So the veterans have, they've done a huge study with veterans looking at cancer and Alzheimer's risk. And lo and behold, there are some differences. So people basically, among veterans with cancer history, treatment with chemotherapy, but not radiation, reduced the risk from 20 to 45 percent, depending upon the type of cancer they had. The exception was prostate cancer. That didn't show any decline. But still, the point on these studies is not so, remember, these studies are just suggestions because they're not forward-looking. They're past-looking. So we don't really know for sure its, its correlation it's not causation, but they begin to tell us what we should be looking at. What are we looking at these in, in cancer patients? We should be looking at what are the triggers that go one way or another. What's the difference between prostate cancer and a melanoma? What's the difference between this type of chemotherapy versus that one? These studies give us places to start looking. The, the uh, other interesting study that was reported at AAIC2, which really was an interesting study because I mean, I'm doing this type of research that, that, you know, there's a much higher prevalence in African Americans of Alzheimer's disease. However, this big study, uh, what they were able to do with 3,000 elders that they followed over a long period of time, they found that there wasn't any higher risk once you took into account social economic status, etc. That those social factors seem to be driving this, not the medical factors. Another study, this is the Brand study. This was also a study of uh, subjective uh, memory complaints that they found that actually if you looked at predictors, so older persons who reported a change in their memory were almost twice as likely to be diagnosed at MCI or follow-up over, I think it was an eight or nine year course, six to nine years. And they found certain predictors. Again, this is looking backwards in a sense. But, but it gives us the, the studies in which we need to look at what may be. So they found that when it was associated, when your complaint was associated with a family history, you were a woman, you used estrogen, and you were overweight, you had a higher risk. So a family history was associated with an increased risk. Smoking wasn't an increased risk, but it was a faster time to change. So it also, when you get a large trial samples, you can begin to look at what are predictive features and what are just features about change. Because once we start to understand these triggers, that's what's really important. But the main thing here is back to the same point is, if a physician hears somebody complaining, they shouldn't say, hey, I tested you, your memory is fine, goodbye. You need to start listening to people when they tell you things. The other thing I want to mention, again, back to these big data projects, is this thing, which is the Alzheimer's Association and the Brindle City Foundation, have established this basically, he's a co-founder of Google, naturally. They have founded, now there's a little bit of business in this too, which makes it a little bit harder, but they are going to open this, um, 
this Global Alzheimer's Association interactive network, and I've seen this in use, it's unbelievable. This is essentially a mass of all these different imaging studies and all these different genetic studies, all within the same database, and all open to the world to use. Hi, right. are we done? Oh. Okay, oh, getting there or done now? Five minutes, okay. So anyway, this is the last big data study I want to show you, but that's the key here. And I've seen this in use. We have a, we have a member of the uh, organizing group at, at University of Michigan, Evo, who's in nursing, and he's just unbelievable. He can just pull up. If you want to know everybody who's had a PIB scan, who's between the ages of 35 and 40, and carries the following three genes, he can pop them right up for you. This is unbelievable data, and it's available to everybody. Free and access once you learn how to use the data. Um, but still, so I'm going to skip these, these slides because these are about the roadmap and you can read about this on the internet. This is the Alzheimer's internet. But I want to mention a couple of things. There was a, a, a couple of other studies done at um, AAIC that were reported that I thought were really interesting. Studies that were combinations between the Alzheimer's associations and the Alzheimer's centers in their area in terms of looking for ways to assist families. The, dementia, the San Francisco Dementia Support Network set up these caregiver aspects. All these things, all these different studies. This one, the Partners um, Dementia Care Study, the um, Learn One More Study, all of these studies were developed from the, the local Alzheimer's associations and local universities in trying to get more information out to patients and more information out to their general physicians to say, you need to do an evaluation. Once you do that, you need to understand the importance of it. And then also setting people up with care assistance if they were diagnosed with dementia. Remember, because I said, only half the people even know they have it. So part of these systems were all about how to get used to this large group of people we're going to have with dementia. The, the, um, uh, let me mention this one too, real quick, okay? This one is another interesting study because the big education, this was called the big education, this is the big educational challenge. There are currently 7,500 certified geriatricians, fewer than 1,600 certified geriatric psychiatrists in the U.S. 30% of the 65 plus population will need to be cared for by a geriatrician. Based on these numbers, you'll need 17,000, we should have 17,000 geriatricians. And by 2030, we're going to need 30,000 geriatricians, and right now we're doing 75 a year. So, four different medical schools and their Alzheimer's associations have tied into studies of how to develop geriatricians and neurologists, how to get them interested in dementia. Because the, pro the thing is, if you're in France, you had Sarkozy, who was scared to death of Alzheimer's. He was scared of death of Alzheimer's. He invested a fortune of the French economy into Alzheimer's work. One of their biggest pushes was develop geriatric nurses, geriatricians, and neurologists and psychiatrists to work with geriatrics patients because he was expecting, and rightly so, a huge flood of Alzheimer's patients. So that's thinking ahead. We're not quite there yet, but that's a distinct problem. One problem that doesn't work, by the way, I want to mention that a lot of folks I know have tried the internet the Alzheimer's tests that supposedly test your memory and things like that. And, and actually, some of the data really says you should really stay away from these. Aside from giving you potentially wrong information, they're collecting information. That's probably not a good idea at all. So what can we do for ourselves? I don't need to do any of this. We've already talked about it last year, but it's true. We know. We know that lifestyle changes makes a difference. We know that the things that are good for our heart are also good for our head. We know that for a fact. You can make significant changes if you change your diet. If you watch out and don't get banged on the head too hard, we know that that's beginning more and more to look like an issue as well. Physical exercise and diet are critical in reducing risk, really important. Aerobic, everybody thought, a uh, year before last at AAIC, everybody said, that's all aerobic, aerobic is phenomenal. This year, the non-aerobic people got all upset and they did studies to show how non-aerobic resistance is really important too. So
So regardless, all physical exercise really makes a difference. Social context, intellectual ability also makes a difference.